Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted. This is episode 860. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today's May 31st, 2024. All right, welcome to another episode of Anglican Unscripted. We're glad you could join us. This again, if you don't know, this is our happy place. This is where Kevin and George sit down in front of our webcams and just talk about the news that's going on around the world. And thankfully, the news is usually crazy enough to, to gather an audience, and you're that audience. And we're going to talk a lot, a lot about some crazy news going on. But first, George, how you doing? I'm doing great. Uh, just plugging along. Uh, no change in my life circumstances, so we just uh, wait and pray and hope and right. try not to worry. Yeah. yeah. Eh. My life circumstances brought me out here to uh, Bryce Canyon National Park, and uh, uh, I've noticed that there's a lack of oxygen up here, George. And so uh, uh, if you see me gasping during the show here, it's not me uh, having a heart attack. It's just me trying to, to get that right pace of input. <gasps> output and oxygen <laughs> so we'll see what happens so uh let's see you got some stories you sent me in perfect formatted order and we start up with uh, pope francis it certainly made the news i saw it on daily mail uh pope francis upholds benedict's rules that no homosexuals may be admitted to a roman catholic seminary I'm not sure he used that language, George, but uh, uh, l let's talk a little bit about Pope Francis and uh, his desire here. Well, that's the official word, is that uh, he's upholding what Benedict said. Benedict, a few years ago, said that uh, gay men should not enter the seminary system. Mm -hmm. And the reason why was uh, gay seminarians were not chaste. They were not celibate. And we saw the formation of gay cliques. Uh, that would cover for each other so that there was a culture of omerta, of silence around sexual activities. And that also has spread to the coverage of uh, abuse of uh, children. Right. I mean, what, it's not limited. The silence is not limited just to male on male relationships. It's expanded to everything what someone could get in trouble for. And then uh, what Benedict was fighting against was that these gay cliques, in some cases, had some of their own uh, appointed positions of responsibility as bishops, of seminary leaders, um, and they were excluding uh, people who they felt were threats to them. Uh, the Pink Palace was a derogatory nickname for the Catholic Church's oldest seminary in the United States, St. Mary's in Baltimore, because it was captured by these cliques. And Benedict tried very hard to rid the church of these blocks and he was not successful. And so the official line is that Francis is saying is following Benedict's line. And he gave a talk to the Italian bishops where he warned against what he called the English translation as faggot. Uh, I don't think we could say that without being demonetized by YouTube. <laughs> but, by go ahead. You go. There you go. <laughs> which is a derogatory slur in Italian, uh, akin to uh, uh, what uh, Kevin just bleeped out in English in my language word. Um, how are this Francis being Francis? So it's not always as straightforward as we thought. Francis uh, is the one who was famous to say, who am I to judge and has elevated and supported uh, gay ministries in the Catholic church. He's made a special pet of James Martin SJ, the uh, editor at large of America magazine, who is a gay activist. Um, so Francis is either playing both sides, supporting gay uh, clergy and members of these cliques in, uh, in practice while denouncing them in public, or something else is going on. And so uh, the Vatican's uh, apologized for Francis's vulgar behavior, but I have to ask myself, who's the real target? Now, one of this, this Forcagini, uh, I think that's how you say it. Yeah, that's Brooklyn. pretty good. Yeah, that's the Latin. It uh, has, been applied to people like, has been applied to people like Cardinal Raymond Burke. Mm -hmm. Cardinal Burke is uh, 
is a very conservative Catholic uh, opponent of Francis. Burke has been driven out of his jobs and whatnot. And Burke is very, uh, he likes to dress up. He likes the flouncy sort of side of Catholicism. And, he, and people give him a female nickname. We see this in some Anglo-Catholic circles where uh, some seminaries were known for all the seminarians had girls' nicknames. Now, Burke is very much not part of the gay clique, but that Frocagini slur has been used by Burke's opponents against him because he's uh, effeminate and rather flowery. So is Francis attacking Burke? Is he attacking gays? Is he attacking both? Is he playing both sides against one another? The end result is more confusion rather than clarity about what the Catholic Church really stands on, where it stands on these issues. Well, it's hard to believe we have more confusion because we have all these little papers put out uh, over the last four or five years that says it clarifies their position. When, But when you read it, you're like, no, that didn't clarify anything. And we, as everybody else, is more confused about their position on such topics as homosexuality and blessing of gay couples in the church. You know, kind of leaves us open to interpretation. Moving on to our next story here. Um, general election is going to happen in July in Britain. And that gives us a chance to talk about Archbishop Justin Welby, uh, a frequent topic on this show. And uh, he's being accused of playing politics. That's hard to believe, George. Just, uh, the, the prime minister has called for a general election, and it's believed that the Labour Party will replace the Conservatives as oh, the governing yes. party. Um, it's, it's over. <laughs> okay. And, but... Justin Welby has come out and has been attacked by both the left and the right for playing politics. The New Statesman, which is sort of the uh, thinking man's liberal magazine, yeah. has attacked Welby for his political activism, while the GB News and other conservative outlets have attacked Welby for his political activism. Now, Welby's latest foray was where he was advising the Labour government to drop the two-child limit on welfare benefits or things of that nature. And Kevin, as we were talking beforehand, you said there's a difference between there was a difference between advocating for the poor and the lost and the homeless mm -hmm. and getting down into that level of policy wonkery where you know you are a de facto member of. Uh, where the church is basically an NGO, a left-leaning NGO offering advice to their liberal masters. And Welby's being, a nailed, Welby's being nailed for that. Oh. Well, he's doing what he's supposed to do, but doing it incorrectly. You know, he's supposed to advocate for the poor and the, you know, absolutely. But to do it in a, in a wonkery way, and that's... Uh, certainly our English term of the day, uh, it's ineffective. And you're going to just bring yourself under the scrutiny of the English press, which uh, you don't want to be there, George. Don't want to be under the, that scrutiny. Now, the uh, the church, National Church of England, has issued a call for balance and kindness and not being mean in the general election. Mm -hmm. But that really has no real bearing on the life that it's actually lived because if you look at how the bishops vote in the house of lords they vote in lockstep with the left they're just the labor party on the on the benches of the house of lords so that the the sense of the church of england being a church for all england uh, we we saw with uh, some of the recent surveys that three quarters are opposed to the conservatives and the majority of english clergy were opposed to brexit they, they really are not representative of the mindset of most English men and women or Brit English men and women. Mm -hmm. And this, this divorce is not only political, it's social. Uh, Philip North, uh, who's uh, an Anglo-Catholic bishop, has made great arguments basically saying that we need to get out of this middle-class comfort zone that we're in and really recruit clergy from the ranks of English of England, not just the, the middle classes. Because if we do that, we're basically 
writing out death sentence because the the, the, the the middle classes are becoming more and more secularized. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of an understatement. Uh, let's move on to some. Uh, is this oh, you have Canadian news? It's just still an Anglican church in Canada. Well, let's read about it. Diocese of Huron to convert its cathedral in London's Ontario to a recording studio and entertainment center. Well, at least they're not having that little uh, sled, sled thing in the middle of their church. They uh, so the. Uh, this morning I was walking the dogs. I've got four dogs and I was out, you know, at dawn walking the dog. Beautiful day, before it got too humid. And I'm walking along and all of a sudden I hear a little noise, a drone type noise. And I hear some crashes through the trees and out of the, and out in right in front, maybe 20 yards ahead in front of me, one of these big giant model radio controlled planes, Spitfire crashed and hit the ground and just went phew, and it was the Anglican Church Canada is like five feet above the ground before it hits and just spreads everywhere in a pile of wreckage. Um, the Diocese of Huron Cathedral is located in London, Ontario. It seats 700 people. Mm -hmm. And the cathedral is basically trying to re-envision its role because they have less than 100 people who attend that cathedral and how many they actually get who show up is even less and so they have a huge building which they have to maintain so they've decided uh to get provincial and uh national support to turn the cathedral into an entertainment venue a basically a cultural center for concerts and films and put in or you know uh, theater type seating and convert the worship area into a very small place to one side so that the people uh, won't be rattling around in this giant empty church. No, it's a, a modified all, opera house, you know, with a yeah. studio. Yeah. And this all comes as statisticians predict that by 2040, there'll be no more Anglicans in Canada in the Anglican Church of Canada. Now, I have to say, I can't be critical of the cathedral leaders who basically think, okay, we can't afford this place. We can't keep it up. So we got to do something, and the plan is to basically make this a center of high culture for London, Ontario. Well, I applaud them that they have a plan, but their plan and the plan of the Anglican Church of Canada has not been, let's preach Jesus Christ and him crucified and risen from the dead. Perhaps if, I know that sounds simplistic, but perhaps if they preached and taught Christianity, they would not have to worry about the utilization of their properties. Yeah. I, know. I would say Canada itself is more secularized than America. Uh, it's certainly more liberal. It has less uh, freedom in its government policies. And it's interesting to see they, you know, when did they officially dump the gospel? You know, was it the late 70s? You know, the Anglican Church of Canada? Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's still some solid dioceses, uh, but then again, the, it, it it's a it's a smaller, actually more extreme version of the Episcopal Church in some yeah. respects. So I don't know. They, I mean, they're left with their only choice, and that's if we're going to be able to heat the building in the in the winter time, we need to to bring in uh, bring the world in and let it use our our building for non Christian purposes. Let's see what's our next story here, George. Um, Church of England Evangelical Council warns. Gay blessings are coming in the Church of England, no matter what people say. And I have to agree with them. You know, if you watch Facebook and Twitter, uh, it doesn't take too much imagination to see that gay blessings is already happening in churches uh, throughout certain dioceses in the Church of England. And here, um, there's accusations that the bishops support this. Of course they do, George. Uh, uh, Andrew Goddard has printed an article in... Uh... Sufizo, which is Ian Paul's website, which we've reprinted links to, basically saying that uh, the problem right now is lack of leadership from the bishops. The bishops have decided at their recent meetings that they're going to allow some dioceses to go ahead with gay blessings, allow partnered gay clergy, who are supposed to be celibate, by the way, 
to be married and sort of uh, remove the facade. And this ignores the legal advice given to the uh, bishops by their lawyers. It ignores their own statement that they're not changing the doctrine of marriage. This ignores synod votes. They're just going to do it. And Justin Welby has and Stephen Cottrell have been the cheerleaders for this move. And John Dunnett of the Church of England Evangelical Council is urging conservatives to find alternative Episcopal oversight and to send their money to non-diocesan groups. Some dioceses have uh, steward, uh, good steward trusts, like Southern places, where instead of sending your money to the diocesan coffers, you send it to this trust, which redistributes to worthy conservative, evangelical, or Anglo-Catholic groups. So hold on, but, if, if I wanted Episcopal oversight, um, do you have Bishop Duff's number? I just give her a call and say, hey, oh wait, we reported on her last time. That's not gonna work. So well, are there that's any left? The, the, there are some left, but they're not standing up and fighting. Mm -hmm. We see in the vote tallies, there are a core of 15, 20 bishops who are standing for the traditional faith and truth, but they're not doing it in a public manner that often. Now, yes, uh, the Anglo-Catholics will stand up and shout when the, the, the women's groups say, uh, get rid of the protections for those who oppose to women bishops. Um, you'll see individual things, but there's been no leadership amongst the conservatives to, in the among the bishop conservative bishops, to uh, fight and provide this alternative oversight. And you mentioned Jill Duff; she was the woman bishop who voted against all this stuff and was very vocal about it. But then she goes and lays hands on a gay partnered bishop in Wales who uh, and does something and does something that the bishops who did this for Gene Robinson, same exact situation, were cut out and cut off from the rest of the Anglican world for, for laying hands on Gene Robinson. How's she, Jill Duff not gonna it's not escape that fate? Has she regretted it? Has she issued a statement saying I should not have done it? No, not that I'm aware of. She not just basically issued a statement saying, oh, what was the polite thing to do? Uh, I have a house in Wales. I'm an honorary bishop in Wales. And therefore, I was just playing nice. Well, there's playing nice. And then there's being mm, yep. dumb and self-destructive. Unaware. Whatever. Whatever the word we want to pick. Yes. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. All right. So let's move on. Uh, we've talked a lot about Nigeria and the relationship with the ACNA in the past and how, you know, these wonderful African countries helped form the ACNA and GAFCON in, in the early years. Uh, many were quick to let it go when the ACNA was formed. Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, hands off, ACNA is doing really good. Uh, Nigeria took a long time to take its sticky fingers off uh, some of the stuff in, within and around the ACNA and here in America because it's a, it's a great country to start a church. Uh, Nigeria has a wonderful um, history of starting churches here and, and seeding them, and they grow, and they're fantastic, and they serve the Nigerian immigrants to this country. They've been wonderful. So they have a hard time giving up things. I was very interested to see that they gave up uh, their uh, European network and gave it to the ANIE. Yeah, last the week, the, the Anglican missionary congregations in Europe, which were a collection of Nigerian uh, expat congregations across uh, Europe, uh, officially joined the Anglican network in Europe. They basically were moved from the oversight of the Church of Nigeria to uh, uh, ANIE. So that was a major move. And the United States last, earlier last year, we had all that uh, fight that over the Diocese of Jersey, Trinity. Yeah. yeah. And where the uh, the Church of Nigeria finally acceded to the ACNA's request and de turned their diocese into missionary districts. And the local uh, diocese, the Trinity Bishop, K. Abadouin, fought this and uh, made himself a, a thorn in the side of the Church of Nigeria, and he was suspended for his efforts. Well, he was just reinstated as a bishop of good standing. So either 
they've worked out things or, uh, you know, he's I can't think of anything else. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it was either a temporary suspension or they've worked things out. So, which is good. I, you so, know, I, I like to see people return to the fold after being held accountable. So, so it, there are people within the Nigerian expat community who very much do not want to relinquish the Nigerian label. Mm -hmm. um, and people like Bishop Felix Orji in the United States, who went from the Church of Nigeria to the ACNA, have come under a lot of criticism, much of it unjustified, in the sense of he's being almost like a traitor. Uh, it, in other words, nobody doubt, doubts the, the, uh, the orthodox credentials with the small o of the ACNA and Bishop Orji, right. but he was given a lot of grief for decoupling that with being in the Church of Nigeria. So you got to give him and, and those people a lot of credit for trying to move past, uh, like the old Catholic Church model in the United States. When I When I was in seminary, I lived on a square in New Haven, and there were uh, four Catholic churches, one on each street of the square, but one was Polish Catholic, one was yeah. Italian Catholic, one was Lithuanian Catholic, one was Irish Catholic. And none of these Catholics talked to each other. They were all ethnic churches. And the Church of Nigeria, there's some who want to keep that going and others who want to be part of a universal church that is uh, tied to the locale where they live. Oh, that's good. In my world, that's good news, Georgia Theory, that they were able to join up with the ANIE in Europe. Let's go here. Uh, you sent me a story. It says, first women bishop in the Church of North India. And uh, these, now, I can't read the second paragraph because these are words I, and names I cannot even pronounce, George. Well, the Church of North India has consecrated Violet Nayak to be the Bishop of Fulbani. Uh, South India already had a woman bishop, Pushpa Lalitha, so now the Indian church has uh, joined the ranks of other churches in the Anglican world with women in not only rules permitting, but women exercising ministry in all orders of ministry. Mm -hmm. um, this was a big development because India is not a country where women's rights and women's positions are, uh, certainly in the Hindu culture, oh. are uh, held to be high. Uh, or in Muslim culture. In fact, one of the things about women's rights in India was it's long tied to Christianity because the Christian missionaries were the ones that established women's colleges and universities and trained nurses and provided professional paths for women. So the it's just like the church of uh, Uganda and Kenya. You know, ever since the East African revival where women played a major role in the 30s in bringing the faith into the rural world, the, the, the perception of women clergy is very different than it is, say, in the United States in some circles. Um, I'm jumping a bit, but uh, you and I are seeing petitions circulating ahead of the uh, ACNA uh, uh, assembly calling for a moratorium on women's ordination in the ACNA or dropping it or getting rid of them. Or So this issue, and now that we're electing a new archbishop, these the, these pe petitioners are hoping that we can get a new uh, mindset and uh, drop the uh, entente between the, th the supporters and opponents of women's orders. It's going to be interesting because the undercurrent of, you know, me listening to what's going on, it seems that the five or six leading candidates, if you could call any candidate a leading candidate uh, uh, for Archbishop, are all the conservative bent. Not, f you know, some fully uh, anti-women uh, orders and some middle ground, but willing to do something more than it has been done. And... Um, you know, I this petition comes at the right time if a more conservative uh, um, in the ways of women's orders uh, archbishop is, is elected. But I, I don't, Kevin, think, I don't think they could do anything. But you know, well, Kevin, what are the practical implications? You were telling me that in talking to your sources in the ACNA, it's not that they're like the Episcopal Church where they have a surplus of unemployable women clergy. In the ACNA, they've got a clergy shortage. They do. The, certain dioceses uh, have uh, churches where they cannot fulfill 
the role of priest or priest in charge. They have the money, they have the budget, they have, they're have they out there campaigning and interviewing, but there's just not enough uh, available priests to who are going to relocate uh, to serve a church. And that is a difficulty if all of a sudden you have, I mean, a moratorium would just stop future uh, uh, installations of uh, women clergy. So it would not uh, dissolve the current structure, but you need to start raising up a lot more priests if if this is the way forward. And I don't see that being done anytime quickly, George. So they may be shooting themselves in the foot. I don't know. Uh, you know, every time we give the slightest opinion on anything to do with women's orders, we're wrong, we're right, we're heroes, we're losers. You know, <laughs> so let's I don't think... I yeah. don't think there's a political will in the House of Bishops to undo the things that Bob Duncan and Foley Beach did. Mm -hmm. uh, I just don't see it there. And yeah. there are some people who feel very strongly about this. Sure. But there's not the political will at that Episcopal level to implement these changes. Yeah. And I think that just don't disagree that the ACNA is more conservative now than it was the day it started. You know, mm -hmm. that there is, is a trend of more orthodoxy within the ACNA. Yes, we have a certain one or two dioceses that are a little flaky. I, you know, I can't disagree with you there. I'm in one. However, <laughs> um, that being said, you know, its trajectory is going the way the conservatives want it to go, the orthodox want it to go. So, uh, do you throw a monkey wrench in now, and uh, or do you wait for the trajectory to, to work its way through? And, you know, I, I'm kind of the sit back, wait and see type person, if I had any opinion on this at all, which we don't. <laughs> so, you know, just just be patient. You know, if being part of the church and looking at church history teaches anything, the patient survive. And good or bad, by the way. Uh, so... Uh, you sent me another story here, um, Barbados. Now, Justin Welby, the last six, eight months, has put forward the idea that uh, the Church of England and England itself, in fact, all of Europe, should pay reparations. And uh, all you need to do is apply. Well, it looks like the the, uh, the Diocese of Barbados needs to apply, George. That they, where, do we, where do we sign? On Saturday, last Saturday, the Diocese of Barbados had their synod, and Bishop Michael Maxwell said he is going to work very hard to get money out of the Church of England and out of Britain uh, to pay for reparations for the transatlantic slave trade. And the poor bishop, the, the problem is Justin Welby has been virtue signaling on this issue for such a long time that poor Bishop Maxwell actually believes that there is going to be a pot of money. And now, you know, the, people talk about it, but how long has it been promised? Over a year and a half, going on two years? Has a single dime been spent? Nope. But uh, the Barbados Episcopal Church is saying, yes, we're, we're happy. Uh, we're, you know, where do we ask? Where do we? Here's where you send the check. And, you know, I hate to be cynical, but... You know, Welby's virtue signaling is just all over the place. And, you know, from in the beginning where he was all hepped up against payday loans, how terrible it was, these high interest loans that you got just for payday. And then it turns out the Church of England was a shareholder, major shareholder in the company that did this stuff. And, you know, it was all part of the virtue signaling, just like his virtue signaling in the run up to general election. And sometimes people actually believe you and listen to what you have to say. And it's a really a shame because, I mean, the Barbados yeah. could use the money. They need yeah. roads, they need schools, yeah. they need infrastructure. Yeah. But probably what will happen is that $100 million will be spent on consultants who, who are of uh, African ancestry but who live in London and New York and not a dime will make its way into the field in uh, the Caribbean or uh, Africa. I would say a dime would. You know, but, you know, we've seen this before where uh, we try to pay for our guilt and uh, the money just gets wasted. 
and uh, we could have a, a four-hour discussion of just the welfare system here in America and the, and the wasted money over the last uh, 60 years. But we digress. Let's see here. Last story. Last story is going to take a while. Um, and we have to, you know, th these are American-based people we're going to talk about. So we're just talking about accusations. We're not talking about anything libel or anything like that. You know, this is this is just this is stuff we've heard, and we're allowed to say stuff we've heard. George, what have we heard about the the Episcopalians who are eating Episcopalians for lunch? DEI has come back to bite the Episcopal Church in the rear because mm -hmm. the liberals are now eating each other up. Nobody's bothering me, but the liberals are tearing each other apart. There's a whole slew of little stories. And one of the batshit crazy liberal women seemed to figure prominently in all these stories. But this is just an accusation, the stuff we've heard. Okay. <laughs> Here's the first story. A few years ago, the Diocese of Vermont, which is a tiny diocese, less than 2,000 people, um, it's basically smaller than my deanery here in Central Florida, and it's a whole state. And Vermont like, probably is the whitest diocese, the whitest state in the sense of uh, maybe Maine, yeah. but you know, they don't have a lot of black people in Vermont. It's Northeast uh, Caucasian, yes. Uh, I mean, maybe North Dakota might rival it. I don't know, but North Dakota is a Native American. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, but okay, so they elected a black woman who had no real qualifications apart from being a black woman with a hyphenated name and a very ethnic hairstyle, you know, braids all stuck up, all this and that. And the Diocese of Vermont was quite pleased with itself for making mm -hmm. this step. We, the whitest diocese, and hyper-liberal, hyper-liberal to the nth degree, have shown our liberal credentials by hiring as our bishop this black woman. Well, it's not worked out too well. Uh, she she has accused half of her standing committee of racism, and so four out of the eight, you know, four people have resigned from the standing committee. She will not. Uh, Living Church has a detailed article about this. She will not publish her visitation schedule because she's afraid that she'll be attacked, that her life is in danger, um, by her opponents within the diocese. Now, Kevin, there's exactly like three old-fashioned Vermont Yankees left in the Episcopal Church. The rest of these are transplants from New York and New Jersey, the Bernie Sanders type who happened to go to church. This is who elected her. And because of her incompetence in uh, managing uh, the diocese, how, well, how, they want to get rid of her. Yeah, accused of competence. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Implied. Yeah. Alleged. Alleged inability to do her job. There you go. Um, one of the things was that she kept the churches shut over COVID long past most other places. And we had a lot of these churches that wanted to reopen and say, hey, we're dying here. We got to reopen. Or, you know, she said, no, no, no. Uh, can't do it. Can't do it. And when they tried, she shut them down. Um, these are not like left-right things. These are hard left and crazy hard left fighting each other. And the Episcopal Church nationally has weighed in, and of course they back the bishop, which they always do, unless there's a smoking gun or a video. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, Vermont is imploding, and there are now talks about merging Vermont, Maine, and New Hampshire into a single diocese because they can't make a go of it. The three of them can't make a go of it anymore. Um, Another thing, uh, El Camino Real, we've been given correspondence. Uh, a deacon in that diocese has been disciplined for racial animus towards Filipino congregation members, both uh, physical altercations, verbal altercations. And it basically has come down to uh, middle-class white women telling little brown people what to do and how to do it and how to believe and what to think uh, because, you know, the, these uh, people are smarter than we are. Mm -hmm. And uh, now 
the the diocese had eventually did discipline the deacon but they basically told the congregation look if you keep complaining we're not going to give you any grant money you know you just accept what we're doing and we'll move this woman on uh otherwise you're not going to uh partake of the beneficence of the diocese of Al Camino Real um, in uh, the house of deputies has got, got had, had a um, uh, a, uh, an Episcopal woman priest, the vice president of the House of Deputies, announced she was challenging the president of the House of Deputies, Julia Ayala Harris, for the office. Well, now we've got a third candidate, a black woman, is running for election. And so now we have a Hispanic, a part Native American, and an African American woman all running to be president of the Episcopal Church's House of Deputies. And all are waving the banner of DEI. We need a Native American, we need a Hispanic, we need a black. We, white men are not really allowed to apply for any of these jobs anymore. And the, <clears throat> the end result has been uh, continued. Well, you get what you pay for. And Thank DEI, it's, uh, when, when, when merit is not the criteria but the color of your skin or your chromosomes or your what you think your chromosomes should be, when that's more important than merit, you have institutions collapsing on themselves. No, and that's been the biggest problem here recently at the college campus level. Uh, I'm sure most of my audience has heard of Twitter. Many of you have Twitter accounts. I follow uh, some liberals on, on Twitter because that's what I have to do to keep an open mind, to keep my spirit free, to, to be fully educated. And one of them is a, a, a history professor um, who has about a bazillion credentials, and he teaches woke history. And because he's a white male, uh, uh, and about 40 years old, he cannot find a tenured uh, college job anywhere. Not because he doesn't believe the woke, not because he doesn't believe in the DEI, not because he couldn't uh, talk about intersectionality all day long, but because of the color of his skin, uh, he has all these uh, um, denial letters from college universities all over the country. Uh, they are looking for their history departments to be staffed by a person who is not Caucasian and especially not male. You represent the problem. We can't have our students sitting in front of a person who represents the problem. And that's happening all over here in, in the United States as far as uh, the uh, college campuses are eating their own as well. It's not well, just the Episcopal Church. Well, we may have an aberration because Florida is now a sanctuary state. Yes, it is. No. <laughs> but, you know, Governor DeSantis, uh, the Florida higher education system has specifically banned that sort of hiring so that uh, white men are allowed to apply for academic jobs in Florida, the state, University of Florida, and on down. And we'll see what the long-term implications are. Will Florida actually benefit from advancing merit in its educational institutions? Um, well, the, uh, you know, they, the University of Florida had their share of campus protests, and what did they do? They they brought out the police and they cleaned up the spot and it was gone within 45 minutes. Um, I don't want to sound like a member of the Chamber of Commerce and boost all things Florida, but we really are almost living in two different countries uh, in the sense of attitudes and, uh, you know, structures and like my recent trip to Seattle, it is a different world. It's a different America than it is in Florida. Yeah. yeah. Jill and I travel and we, we see, you know, the, the absolute poverty that some of these liberal cities are going through. It's, it's you know, Las Vegas, uh, uh, Tucson. You just name them all, you know, the people living under the bridges that, that have been forgotten by the cities. I, you know? I was invited to dinner last night at Prishner's house and uh, I sat next to a developer who I didn't know. And... Uh, he was saying that uh, the county is planning on building 10,000 single, allowing 10,000 more single family homes. Wow. Uh, 
which our county population maybe is 50, 60,000. I don't know mm -hmm. for certain, but this is it's a low. tremendous, tremendous, because the highway is now being completed from Tampa. And I said, well, where are these people coming from? And he said, well, the building, we're seeing three ways. We're seeing people moving out of South Florida. We're seeing people moving out of New York and California and New Jersey. And we're seeing uh, young people, uh, young professionals who have the ability to work remotely and they would rather do it in a place where they can afford a house, have a decent school and decent weather. So instead of say working in the suburbs of Chicago and paying horrendous taxes and having lousy weather and overpriced housing that they can't afford or even get into, you, you buy a three bedroom, two bath house for a quarter, $225,000 in this part of Florida and you get good schools, good house and uh, makes the world go around. So people are chasing the the regulatory state is pretty much non-existent here. Now there's some downsides to that, but you, you know the market really. When you interfere and fiddle with the market the way they do in California and New York, there are consequences. Oh, absolutely. And winners yeah. are places like Texas and California and uh, Texas and Florida and Tennessee and other places that are less heavy-handed. Yeah, I mean the red tape and uh, other things that hinder home ownership don't really exist that much in Florida. They want you to, but there is something in Florida that uh, a lot of states probably don't understand, and that's those high insurance rates. Uh, if you want to... Her insurance. <laughs> her insurance. And the, the, you know, the, her, the insurance rates for home ownership in, in the Florida and in, in the coastal regions is just is astronomical. You know, you see, yeah. and you watch the news once. Well, uh, you know, my 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 insurance went up forty percent in three years. Well, yeah, it's because we had three hurricanes. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, what was it? Fort Myers Beach was totally wiped out. We got to pay for it here in Hooterville because yeah. it's you know. So, which is why Florida is not getting the benefit of all the migration, and they're going to places like Tennessee, you know, and uh, Texas and other places now. Yeah. Galveston has horrible insurance rates because of it's on the coast, but it's a big state, so it evens it out. Yeah, but we're well, only I'm, what? How how wide is Florida at its widest? Uh, Three hundred miles. Yeah, yeah a couple hundred miles. Yeah, not not much. much. It's not, yeah, it's a peninsula, and it gets hurricanes from both sides. It does not matter, um, but it doesn't get. You know, it takes like once every six to ten years to get a really bad hurricane, a, a, a sandable destroying level hurricane. You know, mm -hmm. um, you were in, were you in Andrew? Which yeah, hurricane? in 79 in Miami. Yeah. I've been in, I've been in six or seven hurricanes, but, uh, and our house, remember our house was destroyed mm -hmm. in, uh, Vero beach. I yeah. forget 2003, four, five, when we've really, now it's six. We're, we'd already started Anglican unscripted yeah, at that yeah, point. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, you know, just, just, a, you know, there's a lot to be said about living in different parts of the country, but yesterday things really changed here, George. We didn't talk about this in the pre-show, but, um, you can, and this happened in about three or four other stories, uh, take a court case to a specific state or jurisdiction and pretty much guarantee you're going to win a, a court case, uh, I don't know if you remember many years ago, there was the, the famous uh, a climate scientist who produced the hockey stick graph mm -hmm. where, um, you know, it was basically a bunch of junked up data he put together and a formula he wrote and boom, uh, we're going from here to death, hockey stick. Uh, we're going to overheat the, the earth and people will die and we'll melt the remaining glaciers and the water levels will rise up a billion feet. You're, we're all going to die. And, you know, a couple clear headed scientists challenged his numbers and uh, found uh, some emails where he uh, admitted lying to making the hockey stick. And he was able to sue those scientists who had the correct data, correct facts, and evidence, and win a defamation lawsuit against them because he took that case to court in the lovely liberal city state of Washington, D.C., they creamed him with facts. His lawyers were just, you know, oh my gosh, they they didn't they know so much. Didn't matter. 
this, this jury of his peers uh, in Washington, D.C., unanimously sided with Michael Mann and his hockey mm -hmm. Um, you, you can pick the location, location, location of your trial for some things. And we saw uh, Donald Trump lose in a Manhattan court uh, to, and I'm, yeah, I'm not his fan, and I'm going to use this because it's a fun daddy joke, Trump to charges, uh, uh, where he was uh, convicted of felonies for misdemeanor crimes. And, um, geez, that really sets things apart here, George. That's, that's just, that's crazy. The uh, local news is full of uh, officials saying, well, if they can do that to Donald Trump, why can't we that do that to uh, Joe Biden? And why can't we bring charges against Hunter Biden and all these and, different people? Yeah, no, back up, in, back in up, the back. Florida court system. He, he was accused and convicted of a misdemeanor, uh, which is uh, dealing over federal, trying to change the outcome of a federal election, which every politician running for election is trying to do. Uh, Hillary Clinton put out uh, the Steele dossier. Uh, and is that Russia not collusion? Hoax Russia collusion. Uh, Obama called up Harvard and told them to hide his doctorate theses and ma make sure that no reporter can get a hold of any of his, his papers. Uh, Clinton had a, a team of people who were there to uh, stop the bimbo eruptions, all the uh, women who would come forward and talk about all his affairs. Is that not the same type of collusion here? I mean, how many presidents do go, uh, and I'll include W, I'll include uh, George I, I'll include, you know, you go back to probably the third or fourth president we had back in, in, in the late 17 and early 1800s. Boom, they all colluded in some way, shape, or form with the outcome of the election. <laughs> That's their job to get elected. Uh, George, so... Uh, well, a, for, for our overseas viewers, um, I, th I think it may be helpful to understand that this doesn't matter in the slightest to places like where we are, where I am in this part of Florida. Not a single vote will be moved from yes to no over Donald Trump and Joe Biden oh, over these I, activities. I, I, hold on, I disagree. I, I you have made Trump a viable candidate. This mm -hmm. now, they crashed his website trying to donate yesterday. Um, yeah, it, it, this is not going to hurt Donald Trump. It'll only help him because, yeah. you know, I've got how many emails on my thing saying, oh, I'm a political prisoner. Um, yeah. And members of my congregation who are representative of the community in which we live uh, are angry, are angry about what they see as their country and their system you know, being taken away from them without their participation in it. Yeah. Uh, as an eavesdropper at dinner last night, because we go out to dinner once in a while, uh, that was the conversation for the four or five tables around us. And all of them felt sorry for them, him, even though they had never, some had or had not voted for him. There was this, this ire of, is this what America has become? And I'm like, uh, yeah, I mean, certainly Manhattan. Certainly, liberal conclaves like Washington, D.C. has become this. And this may be our, the last opportunity for conservatives to overturn and stop some of the craziness. But, I yeah. enjoy Franklin Graham, one of the people I enjoy uh, subscribing to on Twitter, X. Mm -hmm. And I think he put it this the best, that our co country is facing an unprecedented crisis. And the only way forward is prayer is asking the intervention of Jesus Christ in our hearts and our lives, and in that way, transforming our country. So what Graham, who is a political supporter of Trump, wasn't one of these people saying, well, let's take to the streets, let's do this or that, but rather, let's get on our knees. And I know some people will find that sort of advice very irritating, but I do think it's really the only true way forward to allow God's will for our lives and for our country to be made manifest and known to us. No, it's, I mean, sadly, it's become our end choice. But yes, you know, nothing else is going to work. We've tried. We have tried everything else in this country to 
to find a way forward. And it hasn't worked. Why don't we try prayer? Why don't we try humbling ourselves and seeking uh, the face of God in this? Uh, politics has served uh, very uh, little either side of the political spectrum in the last 20, 30 years. Well, you and I both have had a series of family and personal crises over the mm -hmm. past few months and years. Yeah. And, <laughs> what you about and it's, <laughs> it's never, it's never a, a function of getting even or getting back or mm -hmm. if I do this, then that'll happen. We've, I know in my case, and I've observed in your case, is when you turn this over and allow God to direct your heart, then you can find the good and benefit from the crises mm -hmm. rather than be continually beaten and hurt and whatnot. Right. So God, you know, what, what Satan meant for evil, God can use for good. And that's true not only in our faith life, but in our political life as well. Yeah, it is. I mean, you and I over the last... Uh, you know, how I don't remember how long we've been doing this, almost forever. But, you know, uh, transparency and seeking uh, uh, God's uh, way in this is always work, but also being able to uh, acclaim Him at the end of the day.